Spirit Halloween is everywhere and we all love it. I love Spirit Halloween. Look at me having an absolutely wonderful time. That was the joke. What's, what was the joke? This. It's great, but something always feels off about the seemingly endless parade of locations they have. Could it be their environmental impact? Their exploitation of fast fashion labor? Their cannibalization of small businesses? Yes, yes, it's all those things. This business represents everything wrong with capitalism. Hey, Spirit Halloween, sponsor me. I hear you have wonderful programs for influencers. $1,000 for 100 retweets. But the most secretly spooky thing about the business is what the overwhelming amount of locations reveals about North America American urban planning practices. <laughs> wait, wait, don't go. I promise this is worth talking about. Look at me. We're in this together. We cool? Cool. We cool, we cool, we cool, we cool. I've got spirit. Yes, I do. I've got spirit, and so do you. And you. And you. I'm serious, though. Spirit Halloween might have a top-notch real estate team, but they're not making the physical buildings from scratch. They had to source from somewhere. The fact that Spirit Halloween has over 1,400 locations in 2023 means there were over 1,400 empty storefronts just sitting there waiting to be converted into seasonal pop-ups. And while it's not the company's fault there are so many rundown shops, the thought of that much unused space just freaks me out. So I figured I would face my fear and find out why Spirit Halloween has an overabundance of empty retail to choose from and what that means for you and me. Spirit Halloween is not the problem in itself, but it reveals the problem of the way that we develop our cities. This is Rachel Quadno, the program director of Strong Towns, a nonprofit media advocacy group focused on improving urban planning practices. I was inspired to explore this topic because of one of her articles, so I tapped her in to help me out. First, let's address the elephant in the room. Physical retail has declined since the advent of online shopping, which explains why stores become empty. But I'm not interested in why businesses abandon locations. I'm interested in why so many retail spaces exist to be abandoned in the first place. Turns out the key to unlocking this mystery is to note where most Spirit Halloweens are located, with the exception of a couple downtown branches. Spirit Halloweens live and die in the suburbs. If you go on the website and look at a random selection of stores on a street view map, you can see most are situated in either suburbs or on the fringes of large cities, which makes sense. Suburbs in general are built around commercialism. The suburbs gained popularity in the 1950s when the middle class started moving away from cities to escape the dirt and grime of the industrial downtown cores. And so they joined the stream of family life in the suburbs. If we lived in a world that only used Tim Burton analogies, it would be like comparing Batman to Edward Scissorhands. You'd be a fool not to want to live in the saltwater taffy homes. And similar to what we see in Edward Scissorhands, suburbs were designed to be segmented, with large clusters of residential homes and several other pockets serving singular functions. This clustering is deeply rooted in government housing affordability programs and systemic racism. That discussion is far beyond the scope of this video, but I didn't want to ignore the information. Moving on, this segmented design forced people to rely on cars to go anywhere since everything was so far apart. And where were the rich people going with their cars? You can walk or you can roll, you can snack or you can stroll, you can shop, 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 shop. Get in, loser. We're going shopping. Like a beacon in a sea of cookie cutter houses, suburban planners centered neighborhoods around large retail areas to meet wealthy residents' want for shopping and entertainment without having to trek back to the filth of the inner city. Business experts say a good shopping center is one of the best investments known to man. This centering around consumerism included replacing public spaces with malls and other such stores. I remember being a suburban teenager and thinking the only thing thing to do with my friends was to go to the mall. And um, turns out I was right. Who wants to sit quietly in a library at 6 p.m. on a Friday? No one. Basically, everything served the car and shopping. Dotted here and there throughout the huge area are shopping centers where every type of product or service is readily available, designed to draw residents together to help make them feel they are part of a real community. These remain two major considerations in suburban design for decades. It's completely different from how downtowns are planned, with residential, industrial, recreational, and commercial spaces coexisting in mixed-use areas that people could freely access without a car. But as we all know, rich people like having vehicles and reminding people they're rich, so they could build the suburbs however they liked. Convenience be damned. All hail the subtle flat. These young adults shopping with the same determination that led them to the suburbs in the first place are the goingest part of a nation on wheels. It's a happy-go-spending world. But you see, the 
problem with sprawling retail and car-centric suburban utopias is that what people consider utopia tends to change. Eventually, suburban citizens grew tired of the uniformity, reliance on retail palaces, and driving long distances to get anywhere. According to Columbia University researchers examining gentrification, in the 90s, high-income families experienced shrinking leisure time as they worked more and commutes lengthened. This time scarcity, they hypothesized, has propelled centrality to the top of the local amenities list. People didn't want malls and shopping and cars. They wanted to save time and be close to things. Community, recreation, public spaces, small cultured shops, and the downtown cores could give them that. With that, many suburbanites moved into the cities where they shaped and gentrified these once grimy areas to meet their needs. This shaping was only possible because cities were designed with change in mind. Their mixed-use nature gave them the potential to adapt to the times, a feature suburbs lack because of their distinct development pattern, which can also be referred to as the suburban experiment. <laughs> Why not mass produce the elements that go to make up a house just as the auto industry does with the parts that go into a new car. The term suburban experiment, coined by the group Strong Towns, the place Rachel works, refers to a pattern of urban development centered around the car. It's when you build everything all at once into a finished state. All the neighborhoods go up at the same time in uniform chunks, and stores and restaurants are constructed in big clusters. The roads, intersections, and resource grids. Everything. There is no room to adapt. There is no room to improve. There's only Walmart. Yeah, it would never make financial sense to build a store like that in a dense city. And that's because of the way that we value land. The way that land in the center of a city, especially a big city, is valued. There's no way that you could afford to convert like that much land into just a parking lot. But where does Spirit Halloween fit into all this? You ask yourself as you look at the dead body that is suburban planning practices? Well, Spirit Halloween's proliferation is the unintended Frankenstein's monster born from the experiment of combining all-in-once development with retail, car-focused planning. Don't you mean so many stores it's scary? <laughs> <laughs> so we already went over the theory and history of why suburban areas have so many retail spaces. Now let's explore some of the other features that go along with the immediate existence of countless big stores. The number one thing you need to support commercial buildings is infrastructure. Yeah, everyone always forgets about the infrastructure, but it'll get you. Many cities in North America have these things called parking minimums. <laughs> Parking minimums are municipal policies that require developers to build a specific number of parking spaces based on the type and size of the building they're constructing. These policies were created to accommodate all of those people that needed to drive if they wanted to go anywhere that wasn't their neighbor's house. And if developers are forced to make parking spaces, cities have to create infrastructure to allow people to use them. So now the government is committed to using public money to create intersections with lights and crosswalks and traffic rules and transit hubs, all to accommodate private business. Mm. This leads us to our next feature of suburban retail that we all don't talk about enough. Template stores. Template stores are custom buildings designed to meet brand specifications. They're used to make retail locations immediately identifiable to passing customers. Think of how all McDonald's or Walmarts or Targets look the same. Suburbs will allow retailers to develop template stores in their communities without size or aesthetic restrictions to entice them to build there. This is a great deal for businesses. And on the surface, it also seems decent for the suburb, as they gain an influx of tax dollars and clout. How how many times have you been in the middle of nowhere, see McDonald's, and all of a sudden feel like you're somewhere? That's not nothing. The problem is the development of these template stores is very costly for the city, who now have to expand and maintain the electrical and hydro systems for them, plus the residential neighborhoods they're building at the same time, and will inevitably need upkeep at the same time. They cost a ton of money in our public infrastructure that we have to build to support those auto-oriented spaces. So we've got to build like new roads, we've got to extend the pipes and the electric lines out to those new developments um, that again are being built like farther and farther out on the edge of town. But no matter how hard towns tried to get stores to build and build big, for whatever reason, be it changing customer behaviors or market shifts, stores shut down, leaving behind odd looking empty structures surrounded by parking lots no one wants to park in flanked by intersections that serve no purpose. So instead of businesses bringing value to communities either culturally or monetarily, cities are left with debt and albatrosses. It's even worse when store closures happen in malls. Big box or department stores often function as something called anchor stores. Anchor stores 
are the really big ones you can enter from the outside and encourage people to visit the mall. When a mall loses an anchor store, it also loses a lot of the foot traffic smaller stores inside the mall rely on. Without foot traffic, the smaller stores go out of business or leave. This is how you get a dead mall. A dead mall is one with high storefront vacancy and low traffic with little incentive for management to maintain it. From a distance, these malls may appear intact, but as you look closer, you see they're actually shambling zombies of what they used to be. Populated by non-specific tchotchke stores, off-brand dollaramas, and that one Ardeen that's holding on for dear life. Zombies love blanket scarves. But if you look even closer, you can also notice something beautiful. There's always people. Not shopping, but getting coffee, walking around, socializing. One time I saw a very adorable couple openly performing sex acts on each other by escalators. They're teeming with life. The couple and the malls. But that's because malls are often one of the only indoor public spaces available in suburban communities. Again, they're designed that way. But when these malls go dead, they risk getting left in disrepair and shutting down. These dead malls aren't just a blow to the city because of everything we talked about. They're a blow to the people who rely on the mall for their social and mental well-being. While there isn't a spirit of Halloween here, this is Wood Buying Mall in Rexdale, a rundown suburb of Toronto. Speaking of Halloween, this is where they shot What They Do in the Shadows Season 5 Episode 1. Malls are fascinating places full of fascinating things. <laughs> Even without the what we do in the shadows, this mall is extremely special to me. My grandparents used to take me on day trips here, I had my six month birthday here, and my parents had their wedding pictures taken at the fair. That's right, fair. Woodbine Mall is home to the largest indoor amusement park in all of Ontario. Not 20 years ago, this place was happening. It had three different anchor stores, Sears, The Bay, and Zellers. For you Americans, The Bay is an upscale department store, and The Zellers is like our Walmart. But then, Sears and Zellers went out of business. The Bay became a waste land where you could also get vaccinated. This is where I got my second COVID vaccine. It didn't have furniture at the time, but this is this is the space. They just cleared everything out. Brand name stores left and were replaced with weird little mom and pop shops that sold nothing specific. They sell bedding. This mall that meant so much to me died. I visited recently outside of recording this video because I wanted to be nostalgic, but it wasn't the same. It was sad. They painted what used to be a nice copper exterior a muted red and installed these foam animals and dinosaurs to entice people into the mall that also quickly went into disrepair. Why did they put an anus on every dinosaur? Why was that necessary? I think this is a really old trash can, like it's one of the original trash cans, um, but they didn't move it when they painted the building, so just paint spilt on it, and now they ruined the actually very beautiful trash can. But you can still see people walking around the mall, chatting, socializing, having a good time as the stores slowly crumble around them. That's the plan for what they want to do with wood buying, but I don't know if they're actually gonna do it anymore. And while they don't have a spirit Halloween because there aren't any large enough vacancies, they do have a place that sells unopened Amazon packages where Zellers used to be. And Zanardine. The fear is that the mall will shut down entirely and become this. This is Honeydale Mall, the only true ghost mall in Toronto, which means it's completely shuttered, there's no one here, and you can't get inside, and it's been like that since 2013. You can see they used to have a Walmart, but when Walmart left in 2004, the mall owners decided to just let the place go into disrepair, and now we have this giant structure that no one's allowed to go in or use, surrounded by parking lot that no one's allowed to park in. And look what else they have. Oh, an intersection and a stoplight. Do you know how much I hate that stoplight? I hate that stoplight. Now you may be thinking, if there are so many large retail vacancies in suburbs, be they big box or anchor, why don't we just fill them in with other businesses? Great idea. Except, like I said, these buildings are usually very specifically sized and designed. Because of that specificity, these buildings can be unusable. They're usually too big and expensive for small independent businesses to rent, and other mega retailers have their own design and size needs. So the empty stores stay empty. Take Blockbuster, for example. When they went out of business, they didn't just just leave behind a bunch of unreturned Terminator VHSs. They also left many real estate agencies an extremely hard time filling the vacancies because of their unique building sizes. According to Doug Le Patrol, La Patrol, listen, I don't know if that's how they pronounce his name, but as a Canadian, I intrinsically feel like I know how to pronounce French words, and I'm usually wrong. Um, so according to the VP of Collier Canada, being 5,000 to 6,000 square feet, that's a big space for smaller markets. And you can't just fit a Shoppers Drug Mart or London Drugs in one of those stores because they want 15,000 to 20,000 square feet. 
streets. Those massive big box stores can really only be one thing, which is another big box store. There's not that many of those around and there's, you know, there's only so many of those that any city needs. But you know who would and probably did take those spaces? Spirit Halloween, who like a bat out of hell snatches up dead storefronts of all sizes, brings joy to the community, then leaves without a trace. Exactly like a bat out of hell. This is one of the only Spirit of Halloween stores I know that's in the middle of an actual downtown core. We're in downtown Toronto right now. And I think the reason this building is the Spirit of Halloween and hasn't been like co-opted by a local business is because it's a template building. Look at it. That's an LCBO. It's a large liquor store we have here in Ontario and it's too big for anybody to really rent it out because it's very clearly an LCBO. Let's go back to home. I think the scariest part of this story is that we've basically built ourselves into a corner. There is no real solution. Sure, you could take away parking minimums and campaign for mixed use towns and prevent stores from making specialized structures, but it's hard to make change when everything is set in concrete, literally. I don't really foresee a use for these spaces. Like the vast majority of them are just going to fall into disrepair and hopefully eventually be knocked down. Spirit Halloween comes in to fill that void, they see an opportunity in the many, many vacant storefronts that we have in our communities. They go occupy for a few months and sell a bunch of Halloween costumes, and uh, then they too leave that, that building behind. I think through all of this, we learn the importance of developing cities that prioritize people, not corporations or the next cloud chasing project. We need to foster smaller, human scaled, mixed use communities within existing city limits that support local businesses and residents' social and mental well being, where people aren't isolated from what they need or forced to rely on retail or cars they might not be able to afford to have a meaningful life. But until we make cities more adaptable, it looks like we're stuck with Spirit Halloween to shine a little light in communities we've doomed to slowly descend into ruin in the pursuit of short-sighted status and wealth. So as spooky time rolls around and you're excited to visit all seven locations of your favorite Halloween pop-up within 30 minutes of you, remember why you're able to have so much close range fun. And when you explore a new spirit Halloween and spend entirely too long looking at the haunted swing, Think about how it's all built on the back of plastic waste, sweatshop labor, and towns that prioritize Walmart over people. And that's my take on Spirit Halloween. I hope you all feel bad about yourself and your seasonal traditions. This is what you get for not watching my zombie video last year. I'd like to take a moment to thank Rachel Quedno from Strong Towns for speaking with me for this video. Strong Towns also has a YouTube channel where they talk about urban planning practices in a very accessible way. I know I try to make urban planning look sexy, but like they do it so well. Highly recommend you check it out. The link to their channel will be in the description. Thank you guys for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video and want to support the channel, you can push the like button, subscribe, and or follow me on Instagram at 500 Days of Ari. I'll see y'all next time. Bye.